Hello everyone and welcome back to another video on using .NET 6 with AWS Lambda and AWS SAM to build serverless applications on AWS. Today we're going to dive into what an actual project looks like when you're building a production application. So in the video so far, the code samples we've had had been pretty trivial, really. They've not really done anything you would actually do in the real world. So the code we're gonna look at today is an actual API to perform CRUD operations against DynamoDB. So they're gonna take requests in from API Gateway. We're gonna perform some business logic on them inputs using AWS Lambda and .NET. And then we're gonna store that data in DynamoDB. The primary focus is going to be the structure of the project and how you design your projects in a way to make them flexible, testable, and easy to work with when you're using Lambda. Let's dive into some code. So here we are in the code base now, and there's a link to this GitHub repository in the description below. And what I want to walk through is how I set up my local project structure and my files to best enable easy development on AWS Lambda. And the architecture pattern um, I normally follow is the hexagonal architecture pattern, or also known as ports and adapters. And what that pattern defines is that you have a central core library and that central library is where you implement your business logic the things that make your app valuable any implementation details interactions with databases event buses um, how requests get into your app so the apis they're all implementation details and they're all abstracted away behind interfaces and you can see that in the code here. So I've got this core this core library here. And within this core library, I've got uh, my data model, which is um, a relatively straightforward product class. Um, the product has an ID, a name, a price, a description. And we're also keeping track of the history of the um, prices. Um, you see here, the actual repository for storing my products is simply just an interface. There's no actual implementation of how that data gets stored. And when it comes to actually storing data, actually making requests to create products, again, that's that's sat in its own single responsibility class for this create product command handler. Um, and it's this command handler that's doing performing the business logic to actually create a product. So we create a product using the static method from our product model. Uh, we add the description, and then all we do is make a call to the our product repository interface to create that product. And you see this code here has absolutely no dependencies on any external libraries or other projects. This is pure business logic, and it's really expressive. You could read this and see that a product is being created the description's being updated, and then we're creating that in a repository. The other thing I, I do to keep my, um, my core logic clean is to actually return a data transfer object. So instead of exposing our product model from our business domain outside of our core library, what I actually expose is a data transfer object. And that is broadly speaking has the same structure as my product model, but that allows me to um, develop the interface to my external customers separately from my extremely expressive domain model, which is my product object. So that's creating products. And then when we actually come to query products, it works in much the same way. So we have a query handler um, and that performs any logic to actually query things from our database. In this case, it's relatively simple. We offload that get request to our I product repository. And then again, we're returning a data transfer object. Now, again, there's no dependencies in this code. Everything in here is pure business logic. There's no dependencies on anything else. I've then separately got an implementations library. And that implementations library is where we configure our dependency injection. This is where we do the setup 
of the handlers of our interfaces and how we set up our DynamoDB client, our AWS SDK. And we also add our two handlers. I'm not gonna dive into the details of DynamoDB. That's gonna come in a later video series, but we also do any custom implementation for our data store in this implementations library. So you can see here, we have the actual code for how to interact with DynamoDB. So when it actually comes to tying this all together now, this is where things start to get interesting. So you see, I've got this create product and this get product. And these are two separate class libraries that represent our two separate API endpoints, our two separate Lambda functions. Now, if we look at each of these separate Lambda functions, this is, this is where we're making our Lambda function an implementation detail. So if we use Lambda today, but then later we decide we want to move to, let's say ECS with containers running on Fargate, all we need to change is the implementation detail. We need to change to move to an API, a .NET Core API, as opposed to Lambda. But the actual business logic, our actual code that implements our business logic and our interfaces doesn't change. Lambda's simply an implementation detail for how things get into our system. So you see all we're doing here in Lambda is doing the initial dependency injection configuration. We retrieve our handler from um, the dependency injection container. We do some of the semantics around mapping the API gateway request to um, to check that it's the, the, the it's got a body and it's of the right method type. Um, we do this the DC realization to convert that body to our create product command, and then we have the the boilerplate to actually just return a response. But you can see here our lambda function has got no business logic tied up in it, or no implementation details tied up in it. And the same applies for our get product function. These two functions are almost identical to each other in that we, we configure our services in our startup. We pull some kind of handler from our dependency injection configuration. And then we have the boiler, standard boilerplate to check that um, our HTTP method is correct, that we have the path parameter, um, that if our, that our query actually returns something, but this is all boilerplate. This is all Lambda specific implementation details. All our actual business logic, all our actual persistence implementations are done separately. And that makes things incredibly testable as well. So if I go and look at my tests now, you see I've got a whole range of unit tests here. So I've got core unit tests to test my actual my actual business, my domain model to test my product object. I've got tests to ensure that um, my queries are handled correctly and what should happen if any of my repositories return null or my queries return null. I have tests of my specific Lambda function. And again, I'm not mocking AWS SDKs here. I'm mocking out my query handlers and my product repositories. And it makes my unit tests really robust and, and not brittle. And again, I've got tests here for my command and all these new unit tests run incredibly quickly. So if I just go into my unit test now, I can run that and, and be really confident that my business logic is working as I expect it to. And we'll see there in just a second that 11 tests passed off. So that's how I structure my projects when I'm using AWS SAM with .NET 6. Remember, keep your core business logic free of dependencies. Make that implement your core business logic and your core domain model, and don't let any implementation details leak into that library. You could potentially have a second library for actually implementing your um, persistence layers, event bridges, the actual implementations of your interfaces. And then when it comes to Lambda itself, make sure that the things that Lambda are doing are AWS specific. Don't let any of your implementations or your core business logic leak into Lambda. And that keeps your code incredibly portable and incredibly testable as you move forward and as you develop your applications. 
we're going to touch on a really important topic in the next video, and that is observability. When you've got one big monolithic application to follow requests through your um, application, it can be quite straightforward. But once you've abstracted even a relatively simple API into potentially four, five, six separate functions that potentially then asynchronously trigger more functions behind the scenes, logging, tracing, observability can become quite challenging. So I'm going to touch on how you can configure observability in your Lambda functions with Sam in very few lines of code, as short as four lines of code to add tracing and logging to your AWS serverless applications. I'll see you next time.